are beginning Chapter 19, Intimidation, Threats, and Violence to Protect Sales. I came to realize that, by comparison with the reality, my story was as tame as a holiday postcard. John Lee Carr, The Constant Gardener. It takes great courage to become a whistleblower. Health care is, is so corrupt that those who expose drug companies' criminal acts become pariahs. They disturb the lucrative status quo where people around them benefit handsomely from industry money, colleagues and bosses, the hospital, the university, the specialist society, the medical association, and some politicians. A whistleblower may even have the whole state against him, as happened for Stanley Adams when he reported Roche, Roche's vitamin cartel to the European Commission in 1973. Willie Schleider, Director General for Competition at the Commission, leaked Adams' name to Roche, and he ended up in a Swiss prison charged and later convicted with crimes against the state by giving economic information to a foreign power. Roche seems to have orchestrated the police interrogations, and when Adam's wife was told he could face 20 years in prison, she committed suicide. Adams was treated as a spy, court proceedings were held in secret, and he wasn't even allowed to attend his wife's funeral. The Swiss courts were completely resistant to the argument that Adams had done nothing wrong because Switzerland had broken its free trade agreement, agreement with the EU, which, speci which specified that violations of free competition should be reported. It is only in the United States that whistleblowers may get rewarded to a substantial degree that allows them not to worry, at least not financially that they might never get a job again. However, whistleblowers are not motivated by possible financial bounty, but their conscience, for example, I didn't want to be responsible for somebody dying. Some companies have ethical guidelines urging people to report irregularities internally, and sometimes the leadership is happy to get such information as they might want to take action. But that's the exception. All the companies I have studied engage deliberately in criminal activities, and in the United States, there is a log of nearly a thousand health care quitam cases in which whistleblowers with direct knowledge of the alleged fraud initiate the litigation on behalf of the government, and the Justice Department has suggested that the problem may get worse. It's a pretty bad idea to tell a company about its crimes, just like it's a bad idea to tell a gangster that you have observed his unlawful activities. Peter Rost, a global vice president of marketing for Pfizer turned whistleblower, has explained that Pharmacia's lawyer, Pharmacia's lawyer clearly thought that anyone who tried to resolve potential criminal acts within the company and keep his job was a mental case. Most whistleblowers who have contacted the, co the company have been subjected to various pressures and sometimes seriously threatened. For example, even if they find something the company will throw under, they, even if the company will find, even if they find something, the company will throw you under the bus and prove that you were a loose cannon and the only person doing it. The company violence also extends to other companies. I was fired. Then I took a job. Then somehow, company name not revealed, called the job. Then I was fired. There are many similarities to mob crimes. Those who threaten the income from the crimes are exposed to violence. The difference being that in the drug industry, the violence is not of a physical but psychological nature which can be equally devastating. This violence includes intimidation, instigation of fear, threats of firing or legal proceedings, actual firings and litigation, unfound accusations of scientific misconduct, 
and other attempts at defamation and destruction of research careers. The maneuvers are often carried out by the industry's lawyers, and private detectives may be involved. It is highly stressful to become a whistleblower, and the cases take five years on average. Peter Rost has described how things went for 233 people who blew the whistle on fraud. 90% were fired or demoted, 27% faced lawsuits, 26% to seek psychiatric or phys physical care, 25% suffered alcohol abuse, 17% lost their homes, 15% got divorced, 10% attempted suicide, and 8% went bankrupt. But in spite of all this, only 16% said they wouldn't blow the whistle again. Thalidomide. Private detectives kept an eye on physicians who criticized thalidomide. A, and when a physician had found 14 cases of extremely rare birth defects related to the drug, Grutherl threatened him with legal action and sent letters about 70,000 germ... Eh, well, damn it. Gruenthal threatened him with legal action and sent letters to about 70,000 German doctors declaring that thalidomide was a safe drug. Although the company, in addition to the birth defects, had reported about 2,000 cases of serious and irreversible nerve damage they kept quiet about. Gruenthal harassed the alert doctor for the next 10 years. An FDA scientist that refused to approve thalidomide for the U.S. market was also harassed and intimidated, not only by the company, but also by her bosses at the FDA. The immense power of Big Pharma is illustrated by the thalidomide court cases. They started in 1965 in Sodertijal. Sodertijal. So Turtalji, the hometown of the Scandinavian's biggest drug company, Astra. Astra had manufactured thal thalidomide, but the lawyer had enormous difficulty finding experts who were willing to testify against Astra. In the United States, the company had the company that had distributed th thalidomide, even though it wasn't approved by the FDA had hired every expert there was on birth defects to prevent them from testifying for the victims. In Germany, the court cases were a complete farce. The company's lawyers argued that it wasn't against the law to damage a fetus, as it had no legal rights. Maybe they should have thought about the malformed children, or about the millions of people the Nazis had murdered shortly before this, that, were, what? Maybe they should have thought about the malformed children or about the millions of people the Nazis had murdered shortly before this that were also considered to be subhuman and of no value. Three years into the trial, Gruenthal threatened journalists for what they had written, and the trial ended with a ridiculously small settlement, about $11,000 for each deformed baby. No guilty verdict was ever rendered, no personal responsibility was ever assigned, and no one went to prison. The United Kingdom behaved like a dictatorship state. The journalists weren't allowed to write about the court cases, and people at the highest positions in the country, including the Prime Minister, were more interested in defending the company and its shareholders than in helping the victims. After a statement that lasted for 10 years, the national scandal couldn't be held back any longer, and the company, Distillers, which also sold liquor, faced a public boycott. A chain of 260 stores actually did boycott distillers, and Ralph Nader announced that if the victims didn't get a similar compensation as in the United States, a U.S. boycott would be launched. It took 16 years before the incriminating evidence that had been described in the article on the Sunday Times was forbidden to print finally came to public knowledge. 
This was only because the affair ended in the European court, where Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was asked to explain the mysteries of English law, the rationale of which no one on the continent could understand. The European Commission issued a report that contained the Sunday Times' unpublished article in an appendix. It is difficult to understand that the UK censorship happened in a European country. As in Germany, no one was found guilty and no one was even charged with a crime. Other cases. It is not only the politicians that rather consistently fail to act on the industry's crimes, apart from a few outspoken ones in the United States. The chiefs at the whistleblower's home institution also prefer to look the other way, as they have their own interests to protect. Merck selectively targeted doctors who raised questions about Vioxx and pressured some of them through deans and department chairs, often with the hint of loss of funding. A few days after Eric Topol had called the chair of the clinic's board of trustees to complain about Topol's views on Vioxx, his titles as provost and chief academic officer at the medical school in Cleveland were removed. Lawsuits against Merck have uncovered details about how the company systematically persecuted critical doctors and tried to win opinion leaders over on their side. A spreadsheet contained information about the named doctors and the Merck people who were responsible for haunting them. And an email said, we may need to seek them out and destroy them where they live, as if Merck had started a radix extermination campaign. That was detailed information about each doctor's influence and of Merck's plan and outcomes of the harassments, for example, neutralized and discredited. Some examples of this are shown in table, neutralized and discredited, wait a minute, an invitation to a thought leader event is like George Orwell's Thought Police, which was the secret police of Oceania in his novel 1984. It seems that Merck had problems both when doctors were honest, like a doctor who wouldn't only present data for approved products or information from peer-reviewed literature, and when they were too honest, for example, frankly, wouldn't not want this type of person speaking for my product. Here's the table, table 19. Quotes from the internal Merck spreadsheet concerning doctors who were critical towards Biox. Strong recommendation to discredit him. A visit from high level senior team not necessary. Needs to be on a larger clinical trial with Biox. Invitation to Merck Thought Leader event. He, this is retarded. I'm not gonna. I think. I think it already went over all this. But just in case you want to pause, pause and read it yourself. I have given many examples that show senior, senior staff agencies can behave just as badly as bot deans and department chairs. When associate director in the FDA's Office of Drug Safety, David Graham, had shown that Biox increases serious coronary heart disease, his study was pulled at the last minute from The Lancet after, seven, after Stephen Gausen, director of the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, had raised allegations of scientific misconduct with the editor. When Graham's supervisors knew were untrue when they raised them. The study was later published, but just a week before Merck withdrew Vioxx from the market, senior people at the FDA questioned why Graham studied the harms of Vioxx, as FDA had no regula regulatory problems with it, and they also wanted him to stop, saying he had done junk science. 
There were hearings at Congress after Merck pulled the drug, but Graham's superiors tried to prevent his testimony by telling Senator Grassley that Graham was a liar, a cheat, and a bully not worth listening to. Graham needed congressional protection to keep his job after threats, abuse, intimidation, and lies that culminated in his sacking from the agency. Fearing his job, Graham had contacted the public interest group, the Government Accountability Project, which uncovered what had happened. People who had claimed to be anonymous whistleblowers had accused Graham of bullying them. Turned out to be higher ups at the FDA management. The FDA flunked every test of credibility while Graham passed all of them. An email showed that an FDA director promised to notify Merck before Graham's findings became public so that Merck could prepare it for the media attention. That left no doubt about whose side the FDA was on. Hearings were also held at the FDA, but the agency barred the participation of one of its own experts, Kurt Ferber, after he had criticized Pfizer for having withheld data that showed that Valicoxib was the latter taken off the market, increased cardiovascular events, which Pfizer had denied. Considering these events, it's not surprising that, that The Lancet concluded with Biops, Merck, and the FDA acted out of ruthless, short-sighted, and irresponsible self-interest. The COX-2 inhibitors that have taught us a lesson not only about fraud, but also about threats. When The Lancet raised questions with the authors over a paper on COX-2 inhibitors, the drug company, not named, sponsoring the research, telephoned Lancet's editors, Richard Horton, asking him to stop being so critical, adding, if you carry on like this, we're going to pull the paper, and that means no income for the journal. Pfizer threatened a Danish physician, Preben Holman Jorgensen, with litigation after he had stated in an interview in a newspaper, in accordance with the facts, that it was dishonest and unethical that the company had published only some of the data from its class trial on celecoxib. Outraged by Pfizer's conduct, many of Jorgensen's colleagues declared publicly that they would boycott Pfizer. Pfizer dropped the charge against Jorgensen, but wrote to doctors and in a press release that Jorgensen was misquoted in the newspaper. This was a lie. Jorgensen was not misquoted. Pfizer also complained to the press council, alleging that the newspaper's criticism of Pfizer was undocumented, which was also a lie. The press, the press council ruled that the newspaper had done nothing wrong. All the wrongdoing was Pfizer's. The threats can be particularly malignant when scientists have found lethal harms with marketed drugs that the companies have successfully concealed. Such threats have included frightening telephone calls from the company warning that very bad things could happen. Cars waiting near the researcher's home through the night, ghoulish funeral gift, or an anonymous letter containing a picture of the researcher's young daughter leaving home to go to school. Not much difference to organized gang crime there. Journalists had also been threatened with reprisals. A lawyer phoned a journalist who had written critically about the drug industry based on my research and said he called on behalf of a friend. He was interested in knowing how she had gotten access to documents that the company considered strictly confidential. He wouldn't reveal who his client was he called again and threatened her by saying that journalists who are critical towards the drug industry may lose everything, their family, friends, and job. The journalist got, ve the journalist got very scared and didn't sleep much that night. Even researchers who have contracts giving them permission to publish or who do not collaborate with the industry at all 
may face legal threats if they wish to publish papers that they that don't fit with the industry's propaganda machine. Immune Response filed a $7 million legal action against the University of California after researchers published negative findings from a clinical trial of an AIDS vaccine, having refused to let the company insert its own misleading analysis in the report. This occurred despite the fact that the contract gave the researchers permission to publish. The company also tried to prevent publication without withholding some of the data. Two British dermatologists had also two British dermatologists had a similar experience. They wrote a detailed review on evening primrose oil for a for atopic dermatitis. Out of courtesy, they showed a copy of the peer-reviewed article of the manufacturers who threatened legal action. The article was never published despite getting proof stage and it took another 12 years before the drug agency withdrew the marketing authorization for evening primrose oil. A Canadian researcher wrote that all proton pump inhibitors are essentially equivalent in her draft guidelines, which she sent to the companies as a courtesy. AstraZeneca, which sold Losec, called for retraction for the guidelines, claiming they were unlawful and threatened legal proceedings. How can guidelines be unlawful? The Ministry of Health didn't promise to pay for her legal fees. In Germany, the president for the Society of General Practice wrote a paper with a colleague from the Drug Commission at the German Medical Association where they also concluded that the proton pump inhibitors were the same. Their paper was accepted for publication in the German paper, Journal of General Practice, but it was pulled at the last minute and caused a delay for that particular issue. The editors forgot to change the list of contents where the paper they censored still appears, but insights they published an advertisement the journals gave in to the pressure from Big Pharma, which the authors considered intellectual bankruptcy. No doubt about that. We must resist pressures and threats, as we should never show anything to drug companies as a courtesy before it is out in the public domain. The threats are bluff most of the time anyway, but not always. When a Canadian health technology assessment concluded that the various statins had largely the same effect, Bristol Myers Squibb sued the agency claiming negligent misstatements. Although the agency won the case, the legal cost amounted to 13% of the annual budget, whereas this sum amounted to one day of sales revenue for Bristol Myers Squibb stat Squibb's statin. Their lawsuit was a type of abuse of power called SLAPP, S-L-A-P-P, -P, strategic lawsuits against public participation. A Danish researcher who was critical towards giving women hormones around menopause received letters with threats of legal action from drug companies, even though it was well documented at the time that the drugs are harmful. When another Danish researcher published convincing data on two occasions showing that the newer contraception pills, Yaz or Yasmin, result in more blood clots than older pills, he was fiercely attacked by colleagues, uh, colleagues on bare payroll, and studies that didn't show the newer pills were dangerous were also financed by Bayer. In 2008, one of my colleagues, when Jen Lundgren, Lundgren, Lundgren received a death threat at the International AIDS Congress in Mexico in an SMS sent a few hours before he presented data showing that GlaxoSmithKline, six million pound Euro, uh, British pounds money, six million British pounds drug 
Adelkavir almost doubled the risk of heart attacks. The pressures had already been immense, and after he published his results in The Lancet four months earlier, and lung and Lundgren described how we are completely crushed in GlaxoSmithKline media machine. We are completely crushed in the GlaxoSmith Glax. Fuck. We are completely crushed in the GlaxoSmithKline media machine when our study came out. The organizers had also received threats, and as soon as Lundgren had finished his talk. He was escorted to the airport with eight bodyguards. Three years earlier, the International Drug Monitoring Center, operated by the World Health Organization in Uppsala, had warned Glaxo about the health problems, but the company downplayed the warnings and sent a reply that was, in effect, a no reply. To coincide with the Lancet publication, Glaxo issued a statement to its investors that downplayed the association between Apicavar and heart attacks, saying that the findings were unexpected and that no possible biological mechanism to explain it had been found. Glaxo didn't mention in its statement that the company had been warned three years earlier or that the company's own research on animals had found that Apicavar is associated with myocardial degeneration in the heart tissue of rats and mice. Remember, when your heart tissue breaks down, it doesn't grow back. Once it's, once it's messed up, it's messed up. In 2012, another Danish researcher came in trouble. They had shown in a publicly funded trial that hydrozethyl starch, a plasma expander used in patients with severe sepsis, kills the patients compared to giving them a much cheaper balanced salt solution. When the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a letter that was promptly sent by the lawyers of the Freinius Cabi AG, the lawyer wrote that Freinius Cabi AG is prepared to take all appropriate legal action to recover the economic losses it has suffered and will continue to suffer as a result of the false information you and your colleagues have reported and called for immediate withdrawal of the paper and corrections to be made within two days. This was ludicrous. The researchers had written he's, H-E-S, 130 over 0.4 in their paper, but should have written H-E-S, 130 over 0.42. 0.42. Did you notice the difference? If we round 0.42 to one less decimal, we'll get 0.4. Well, won't we? The issue that these two designations refer to slightly different versions of the hydrozethyl starch hold sold by two different companies, and the researchers had not studied Freinus's product, but the other one. A 0.4 refers to the degree of molar substitution, which can vary in the same bottle from 0.38 to 0.45. For Freinus's project, and from 0.40 to 0.44 for the same product they had studied. This meant that the two products must be considered equivalent, but, Frein but Frenzius was determined to defend its product even though hydrozethyl starch kills the patients. The lawyer's letter noted that this error is misleading this error is misleading readers of the article and causes them to mistakenly attribute to Valuvin product the negative effects reported to have been found with the tet tetraspan resulting in a scientific harm to Freinus Cabe's reputation and economic damage through lost sales. Pretty ludicrous again, as both the abstract and the methods 
section mentioned the product that had been tested, Tetraspan and not Valven. There was an outrage in the press and the hospital declared that it would support the researchers in the case of legal proceedings. The researchers didn't retract their paper, but published an erratum, which resolved the case. This whole affair was hair-splitting ad absurdum. If I call a person John, although his name is Mike, I make an error. But if I say that's Mike's, but if I say that Mike's height is 1.8 meters rather than 1.82 meters, I don't make an error. I merely use a lesser degree of precision, which is not a lawyer's business. In the media, Freinus Cabe's reputation, which the company seemed so anxious to protect, was completely lost. Its methods were described as sending gangs and of thugs. In 2000, psychiatrist David Healy from Wales was urged to apply for a post at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. CAMH at the University of Toronto by Chief Physician David Goldblum. Two months after Healy had accepted the post, he gave a lecture at the at a conference arranged by his new center where he mentioned that Eli Lilly's antidepressant Prozac, fluoxetine, the best-selling drug of all time, may cause suicide. A week later, Healy received an email from Goldblum saying, Essentially, we believe that it is not a good fit between you and the role as leader of the academic program in mood and anxiety disorders at the center and in relation to the university. The view was solidified by your recent appearance at the center in the context of an academic lecture. While you are held in high regard as a scholar of the history of modern psychiatry, we do not feel your approach is compatible with the goals for development of the academic and clinical resource that we have. Damn. The decision to rescind Healy's job offer caused uproar in Canadian academic circles because Lilly had donated $1.5 million to the center. James Turk, executive director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, explained that development is a euphemism for fundraising. I read that as meaning your appointment will take it more difficult to raise money than we need to pursue our programs. An international group of physicians that included two Nobel Prize winners published an open letter to the president of the university where they wrote that to have sullied Dr. Healy's reputation by withdrawing the job offer is an affront to the standards of free speech and academic freedom. The stakes were huge. Lilly made $2.6 billion from Prozac in 2000 alone and, just, and had just succeeded in getting the drug renamed and repackaged as Seraphim for severe premenstrual tension, which would keep the profits rolling in until 2007, although the patent for Prozac was just about to expire. Healy's findings weren't new. Six months earlier, Healy had published his concerns in the Hastings Center report, which caused Eli Lilly to withdraw its support to the Hastings Center. Industry money is everywhere. Like a metastatic cancer that threatens to kill our societies as we know them and our free speech. Healy suspects that Charles Nemiroff was behind his res Charles Nemiroff was behind his rescindment. Nemiroff had strong links, including shareholdings, to manufacturers of SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that had been involved in court cases where Healy was an expert witness. Nemiroff was present at the Toronto meeting and announced at another psychiatric gathering the next, ga the next day that Healy had lost his job before, before Healy knew it himself. Nemiroff was hostile to Healy's work and he had berated him a year earlier over Healy's study and 
and berated him a year over a year earlier over Healy's study that showed that two out of twenty healthy volunteers became suicidal on cetraline Zoloft. According to Healy, Memorov has had stated that Healy had no right publishing material like that, and that it was immaterial what psychi what psychiat what psychiatrists did as their companies were answerable to their shareholders and profit was the bottom line.